accidents because, well, you number one, you just have to go over there and see how it works, you know. I mean, these motorcycles are weaving in and out of cars, and there's four, you know, they make four lanes out of two-lane roads. and <laughs> But on a highway, it's normally, you know, they, they normally uh, stay within the lines and all, and I, I don't have any idea what happened. Most of the time, these motorcycles are they 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 stay on the you know on the right hand side of the road if they can even off of the right lane if there's enough shoulder for them to travel on. I don't know what happened, but the green is trying to find out. But again, whoever hit them, I think they know it was a jeep of some sort that hit them. Of course, they call. You know, in almost any SUV, a Jeep. So uh, that you know, what we don't really. But somebody must have saw that. But I don't know that they got any more information. And they were in a rural area where there's no cameras. Uh, they don't. I don't think they know who did it. And so it's a sad situation. But anyway, they, I think they're going <clears> to. <throat> it actually happened yesterday evening before dark. They're supposed to bury him today. In the Dominican Republic, they don't uh, uh, yeah, they don't embalm hardly no one does because they can't afford it, and therefore they normally bury within twelve to twenty four hours after a death, and uh, they just put their bodies on real, real cold in a real, real cold room very highly refrigerated and then they, they take them out of there just before the burial and let the family visit them and all, and whoever. Anyway, pray for Brother Green too because he'll be going today after his service to Igway to help Brother Rudy with the funeral. <clears throat> he, Brother Rudy, looks to him for oversight. So anyway, it's a sad, that's a sad situation. Um, I might uh, I want to mention something here about uh, and I've, I've mentioned it before uh, this scripture in Ephesians the fourth chapter <clears throat> um The seven, let's start in the 17th verse of Ephesians 4. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This is, of course, talking, Paul, to a Gentile church. And <clears throat> so he, he's talking to Gentiles, of course, that have come to the Lord, and he's just given them instruction, uh, you know, that they're to change their uh, mannerism of behavior and how they conduct themselves in life. Having the understanding dark, and he's talking about those who walk in, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of, that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness but you've not so learned in Christ let's go I want you to hold right there I'm gonna I'm not through but I want to stop right there and look at this scripture that I always read in the 119th Psalm <clears throat> uh, the first verse says this is Psalms 119 says blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord 
Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Evidently, you know, there's some people, and even though this was written under the law and it was applied to those that were under the law, there was those under the law who really had a true heart to serve God and to seek God's righteousness. <laughs> and verse 3 says, They also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. Uh, thou hast commanded us to keep the precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto thy holy commandments. I'll praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteousness or thy righteous judgments. I'll keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not, er not utterly. So in verse 3 when he says, They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. I've, I've, I've always used this scripture to, to show that iniquity is doing your own will. It's, it's <clears throat> when you walk in your own ways rather than his ways, you're, doing, you're, you're committing iniquity. It's, a, it's one of the better scriptures in the Bible that helps us to know that uh, well, iniquity is just uh, wickedness or evil adverse to God and so uh, <clears throat> when we walk in our own ways that's, that's, that's where the source of iniquity comes from all that we do whether it's carnal now we'll go back to the fourth chapter of Ephesians um, and the, we'll continue in the 21st verse it says and so if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. That's the scripture that I'm focusing on, that we put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The very fact that he mentions true holiness is a, a great indication that there's such a thing as, of holiness that's not true. In other words, holiness, that holiness means to be sanctified or set apart. <laughs> Uh, uh, the word saint is the same word as holy. It's synonymous. In fact, uh, the Spanish, in, in Spanish, there is no word for holy. The word is santo, which means saint. That's what it means. It's a sanctified person of God. And for us to be have true holiness, to be truly sanctified what sets us apart in true righteousness of God uh, and you've heard me say this before but I want to say it you know I want to I want to um, I want to I want to try to explain it in a way that doesn't tear down uh, the that doesn't tear down the of how we accomplish true holiness. Uh, but what I'm wanting to do, I'm wanting to deal with the law of God not being able to make you righteous or truly holy. Uh, in that scripture in the 119th Psalm showing that uh, serving God with the whole heart. I think there's the answer. 
uh, you know, we can have, you can have a lot of reasons. When you first come to this, when you first start out serving God, you can have a whole lot of ideology in your own minds, what I'm dealing with, of how or, and why you come to church. Sometimes, you know, a lot of you come to church because, you know, well, you start out as children that you, you have to come because your parents make you come. <laughs> and see, that's a law. That's a law to you. But that won't. that's not going to make you holy or righteous just because you come. Uh, eventually, your motive has to, has to kick in. You eventually have to come up with a... Uh, of serving God with your whole heart or because you've got a vision and because you want to serve Him because you love God and you, you're beginning to love righteousness and therefore your purpose for serving God is because of your faith in God and your level of understanding righteousness. And the reason I want to deal with this some and, and see you always you always run into danger when you start trying to get people to understand maybe different from what they've understood before it's kind of like the spirit it's kind of like walking in the spirit or you know uh, the uh, the Holy Ghost getting people to worship in the spirit like, you know, if you go way back in Brother Tucker's day, some of those of you that were here, you know Brother Tucker made people dance. Once he learned out about that, he thought it was right, and so he wanted his church to to get involved more in worshiping God in the Spirit. I, I didn't talk to him, so I don't know his altogether, his thinking on it. But I've talked to enough people that were under him that he was emphatic. He, if you didn't dance, he'd come to your seat and make you. He'd tell you, get out there and dance. At least that's what I've been told. You don't say that's not true? Well, there's people in here that'll tell you that you're not telling what they heard. He was, well, he may not have made you, but you probably did it. But he went to other people's pews and told them to get out and dance. There's people who quit this church because of it, because of that very thing. I could tell you their names. That's their testimony. Yeah. So, uh, brother, I don't. It doesn't matter what brother Mike's saying right now. What I'm telling you is the truth. I've got too many witnesses. Uh, yeah, it was highly. It was highly. It wasn't only highly tit taught or preached. It was. It was almost dictated. That, I'm not saying brother Tucker was necessarily wrong in his day. See, in those days, back then, in those days. It was a man, you know, I mean, men were rough back in those days. And and uh, they dealt, you know, they were dealing with people. God probably had them be rough. Or at least that's where they came from. And that's, you know, it wasn't just Brother Tucker. I could name probably almost all the elders were like that. Brother Freyer was, oh, well, all. I mean, Brother, Brother Patton was that way. He just had more finesse with it, you know. But... Uh, you know, you could you could name a lot of men that you know that were very very strong and how that they they promoted worship. They may not have ever got this body to worshiping <laughs> if they haven't have been strong about it. But here, what I was going to say about that is is that if you try to deal very much with somebody moving out in the spirit and getting in the spirit. You, you, uh, you, you could almost cause them not to get out in the spirit. You say something about people. It, let's just say people dances all the time. I could tell you about churches in this body that don't do nothing but get out in the spirit, speak in tongues, dance and shout. They don't really know too much of the word of God. You know, but you can be the other way too. You can have so much of the Word of God, not enough of the Spirit. So, to have the balance of having both the Spirit of God and the Word of God is very important. That's that's the balance that we're all trying to accomplish. Uh, so, uh, but what I'm what I'm trying to help you to understand, I want our kids to understand it. I don't know if our kids can understand it fully, because 
when you first come to God, you 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 have to have uh, you have to have there is a sacrifice of obedience. There's a sacrifice of obedience uh, of learning how to obey the the righteousness behavior of what is right and what's not. And if you don't already have that in your heart, then you're going to have to learn it. So when you put on this new man, uh, you know, you're... You're, you're having to start out with just obedience. Not like the scripture I use in Second Peter, uh, where you add to your faith virtue. Virtue is a strength. And for you to add virtue to your... And, and the picture of that, faith comes through the gate of the tabernacle. That's how you get in, through faith. And then your first stop is the brazen altar where you offer up your sacrifice. And when you come to God in faith, you have to, you have to learn obedience of, of right doing, which is a sacrifice. It, it begins to mortify the flesh. But let me tell you, obeying the Word of God, it's, that's not, that will not end in true righteousness. If, if it's a law to you, and you're doing it because it's a law, then you're still putting this on and it's, your full righteousness isn't going to come until you understand that my reason for it, it, I've got to grow to a place where I'm not obeying the law or the commandments. See, you, the, the law could never, let me read you a scripture in, in uh In, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Um, this Paul here, he's talking about the, he's talking about the temple or the tabernacle. And let me start in the, In the sixth verse, it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, he's talking about the operation of the, of the tabernacle. The priest went always into the first tabernacle, or the outer court, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high, high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Now this scripture right here is a little bit hard to understand. It says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, uh, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Well, what he's saying is, is the Holy Ghost, this signifying, in other words, now they're in an early church, and now he's applying the picture of the work of the priest in the, in the tabernacle, of how they, you get out of the first heaven, or first outer court, first tabernacle, he called it here, and how you get into the second. There was no way to get in second heaven or third heaven under the law. He, he's saying the Holy Ghost, this signifying. In other words, now that there's a new man and a new birth by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, signifies that the way into the holiest of all wasn't made. In other words, now we understand that there's no way to get into heaven, even second heaven, without the new birth of the Holy Ghost and finally coming to a place of righteousness in, in this holy place. There was no way even to go in there but once a year by the high priest. 
the Holy Ghost signified that. The very fact that they learned that we had to be born again for this operation to take place in us. Now verse 9 says, Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So in other words, <clears throat> this service that was done in the old tabernacle of men taking these sacrifices, people offering up sin offerings, sin sacrifices, taking them into the holy place, God did forgive them under those sacrificial gifts or the makings of sacrifices in the old covenant he, he forgave them for their sins because they were obedient to this shadow of what was to come. But these people were to have a whole heart to really serve God and to understand. They, they understood, I would say, in, in a... I would say most of them understood that there was no way to go to heaven until the Messiah came. You know, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. They had it. And Job, he said, you know, I, I'll have to lay in the grave until my change comes. You know, he's saying... I'll, I'll have to wait. You know, can a man live again? He, you know, he begins to ask those questions. Well, he, he knew that it was going to take a resurrection. Uh, There's some uh, scriptures that allude to that in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied of it. Isaiah the 26th chapter. If you go to if you go to Isaiah 26, now the whole the 26th chapter is, is talking about the day of Pentecost. Uh, and uh, let me read a little bit to you, starting the third. 13th verse with me. He's, um, let's start in the 12th verse. He, he, said, he says, Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Lord, our God, other lords besides thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. They'll not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery... In her pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight. We've been with child, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have, they inhabit, have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In that day the Lord 
with his sore and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon, is in the sea. In that day sing unto her a vineyard of red wine, and the Lord do keep it. I will water it every moment, at least any hurt it. I'll keep it in the night. So here he's, he's talking about, you know, the day of Pentecost, that there is going to be a resurrection. So the Old Testament, they didn't speak about it often, but there's, there are scriptures in the Old Testament that definitely show that they were looking for uh, a, a better resurrection than what they were able to get. They knew that. Uh, they knew it was going to take the coming of the Messiah. Of course, Isaiah's full of his coming and what he was going to do when he came. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going back to the, the ninth chapter of Hebrews where it shows in verse 9 that these things that were on operation in the tabernacle was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service as pertaining perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Um, let let's let's read a few more verses here. Verse eleven says, "But Christ." being come a high priest and good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? He's saying, look, if these blood sacrifices could, if God would sanctify, set, set his people apart, accept their, their faith in that sacrifice and get forgiveness of sins, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blood to God, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, that may be good enough to, to stop right there. Um, um, my point is, is that the law could never purge your, con it, it could never cause you to be truly righteous. Just by keeping a law, if it could, then there wouldn't be no need for Jesus to come. Now, my point in bringing that down here in reading Ephesians to find true holiness, to, to really learn the true righteousness and holiness of God, it has to go beyond, it has to go beyond law. And... I think that we in the past in this body have promoted strict uh, obedience to, to certain traditional teachings that cause people to think they're righteous. In other words, if you equate your righteousness because you hold a standard or because you, you know, you do all these things that we that's necessary. They're necessary. But if you do all these things and you equate that to being righteous, you've missed the point big time. You, you have to do what's right because it's right. Because your understanding of righteousness, it finally has to come to a place where it's not necessarily a law. And you should teach your children that you got to, you know, they're, it's tough. It's tough to raise, I know, it's tough to raise children and put a law on them that has a balance to it. 
And when they're little children, you just got to start them off with law. They don't understand what I'm talking about. You just got to start them off with do's and don'ts, you know, what you permit and what you don't permit. But as they grow, and it's the same way in the spirit. I mean, a new Christian, I don't care if they're 40 years old, if they're a new Christian, they're going to have to learn some, they're going to have to have some teachings of what is right, and they're going to have to obey it because they, they learn that it's, it, it's right to do, even though it may not be in their heart to really do it. But if you push it so far that they start equating that to being righteous, I know people that carry an unbelievable standard. And they're so exalted about having such a great standard, their spirit is rotten. They're no more righteous than nothing. They just dress the part, act the part, but they don't, they're not the part. They're not righteous. It, they, they don't think they have to be righteous as long as they keep the standard, as long as they hold on to the laws and keep those laws. And when you raise your children, when they get older, as they begin to get older, just like God does, you're going to have to start backing off of your children and letting those children begin to, to put into practice what they've been taught. And you can't teach them a law without understanding of what's righteous about the law. You just give them a bunch of do's and don'ts, I promise you, you do that until they get old enough to leave home, they'll leave as quick as they can leave. Some of them may leave before they even old enough to leave. They may run off. That's why we got a bunch of kids in the body today are out of the body. They left the body because they thought the whole body was maybe however a law was being put on them and so strong that they, they didn't understand it. They never was given a chance to even practice their own conscience of what they've obtained. And when you take your hands off of them, they're going to make mistakes. And you have to allow that. God allows it. God's allowing you to make mistakes, isn't He? And God allowing you to, to make, your, make mistakes and, and, and God deals with you. See, you have to get to a place, and your children, when they get to a place, you have to let God. You have to say, all right, I've done what I could do, and now I'm going to have to trust God to deal with them. It's the same way with, with uh, no matter who you are, when you come to God, you're going to have to have some laws, some commandments of Christ until you get to a place that it's, it's not a commandment to you. It's, be, it's starting to become part of your character. This, I'm starting to love righteousness. Out of my whole heart, I'm beginning, you know, when he says your whole heart, it's talking about your mind. It's talking about your thinking. You're finally coming to an understanding. And you couldn't come to that with a carnal mind. It takes a spirit. That's why the Holy Ghost, it's, it's important for the Holy Ghost to help us to get to a place uh, to where we can actually get this righteousness of God in our character. And so, you know, it's, and I understand, I understand, you know, you parents of children, I understand how difficult it is to have the proper balance in your kids to let them begin to develop as adults when they start being adults you know because i've and i've told y'all all that story about the guy you know i ate from carlsbad new mexico and i ate me and sister smith ate with him one time and he was talking about his son he was like you know i thought he was ancient he was probably in his 70s <laughs> and and he was talking about his son you know and he was he was he was sitting there talking he said boy he kept calling him a boy. He said, that boy ain't never going to learn. And I finally, I thought, boy, he must have had this kid late in life. You know, so I finally asked him, I said, how old is this boy? He said, I don't know, Mama, how old is he? She said, he's 52. <laughs> well, I'm just telling you that because parents think their kids are kids. 
it's hard for parents to ever, hardly realize they ever become adults, you know, where they can take their hands off of them and let them become adults. Do you know how old Jesus' disciples were? They were in the 20s when he called them. He died at 33. And I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the priests thought he was just a young whippersnapper himself. You know, but but these kids, most of them do leave home around 18. To, you know, of course, I was when I was a young man, well, you had to be 21 to be considered grown. But I think it's 18 today. Now, they could take you at 18, put you in the Army, and put you on the front lines in a war. You was old enough for that, but you wasn't old enough to vote yet. <laughs> you know, but, but anyway... Uh, uh, my point is, is this scripture of true of righteousness and true holiness that we're finally to accomplish. It goes beyond law. It goes beyond obedience. It goes beyond, uh, and and we we have to. That needs to be part of our teaching. He doesn't need to be teaching that. Uh, you know, this just do's and don'ts for kids that are almost grown. We, that, that's what it has to be when they're little bitty kids. It has to be as when and they become, you know, elementary and, and uh, up before their early teens. When they start getting in their teens, they've got a mind. They've got a mind to understand and it needs to explain to him. I had a sister in my church. was a precious sister one time. And when her kids were up teenagers, they was having trouble, you know, with some of the things that she was telling them they needed, needed to do or not to do. And, you know, one day I heard her, I heard her, well, she was telling me, she was counseling with me something about the problems she was having with her kids. And they were bringing up, why do we do this? Why do we do that? I don't understand this. I don't understand that. I said, what do you tell them when they ask you that? She said, I tell them that's what Brother Smith teaches, and that's what you've got to do. I said, dear Lord, it's not what Brother Smith teaches. Yes, it may be what I teach, but it's the Word, it's the word of God. It's the righteousness in the Word of God. And you need to be able to explain to them what's right. And if you're requiring more out of them than what the Word of God's requiring of them, you need to back up a little bit and, and give them some room. And if you think I'm just talking about one case in here, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. I'm dealing with several things. It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be... T in fact, everybody in here needs to understand it. Everybody for their own selves need to understand that you cannot be made perfect by keeping some commandment or law. Now, you can't, make, you, can't be, you can't be righteous without starting out understanding that I need to change my way of doing things. Like Paul said here, let me go back and read it in, in Ephesians the fourth chapter where he says <clears throat> uh, if so be that you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind See, be renewed by the the Spirit of God helping your mind, the spiritual, you know, in other words, your mind is going to have to become spiritual through the help of the Holy Ghost, and that you put on the new man which after God is created. So by putting that on, you're going to have to, you're going to have to learn what's righteous and what not, and it takes some teaching. It's like we have in the body, we, you know, we've got, we have dress standards. Well, I, you know, I, I've had people tell me well, I don't believe in dress standards, and I always tell them, yeah, you do. 
And people say, no, I don't. I said, well, strip down. Just get naked right here. I said, well, I ain't going to do that. I said, then you've got some standard. I don't know how far you'll strip, but you've got something. You're not believing you ought to run around strip naked, do you? I said, you might not have much of a standard, but you got something. And I said, that's a start. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. Take that mic, sister. The right thing. And all, but now what are you going to do when people notice, they know that we believe in dressing right and, and all like that. And just like uh, the fall. When uh, I was reading my Bible one day about the fall, and, and, uh, and immediately they knew they didn't have, they knew they'd done wrong. So they got fig leaves. Well, the Lord come along, and he made them a coat, and the thought come to me, while I was reading it. A coat covers up more than fig leaves, or, or apron, <laughs> see? Yeah, right. And, and I thought, well, that would give anybody a thought that we are Christians. We are supposed to hide our nakedness and, and all like that. Well, my question is, what are you going to do when people, they know what we believe, and we're trying to be a people that we're supposed to be. And if we're not, we're, we're just messing things up, you know. But anyway, uh, the thought is that uh, what are you going to do when people start asking us, hey, what's wrong? Y'all don't dress like you did. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing something else. Sister Crow, fact, I'm not I promoting. Lady, Sister Crow, listen to me a minute. Sir? I'm not promoting that we tear well, up I'm our standards. You, what, you've got to give them an answer. I'm, well, there is no answer to what you're saying because I'm not saying you ought to quit dressing right. Yeah. Well, when are you saying us, are you saying people who do stop dressing right, what answer they give? When they ask us what's happened to us, you know, we got to have an answer for it. No, I think what she's saying is is if the body loses its standard. No. How, well, what yeah. are you saying? Yeah, we can lose it. Well, sure we can. We can look around. That's certainly not that. what I'm it's promoting. I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. Well, I think I am. <laughs> well, no, what am I, I saying? Then? If I you understand you it, tell me what I'm saying. What What do you think I'm saying? Well, <laughs> tell me what you think. It's okay. Well, you're telling us to, uh, that our children are supposed to be uh, know what righteous is. When well, I know our daughter, I taught her that she's not supposed to think that she's better than nobody else, but to be uh, that we are supposed to dress right. Uh, the way that we live to please the Lord, we're supposed to dress right. I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach our children how to dress right at all. Well... Brother Smith, I don't think you're understanding me. I, I see, I know what you're talking about, you know, but... Uh, Here's what I'm saying. Let me, let me try to make it plainer. There's some people that are so strict in their standards that they're so self-righteous in it, but their spirit ain't changed any. And no standards is not going to make them righteous. But they need to dress right as well as have the right spirit. Right. Right. But they don't need to dress right because it's a law. Yeah. They need to learn to dress right because it's the right way to dress yeah. as a Christian. Right, right. So, and I mean, I've so that's what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is, is that if your child, if you let your child get up 17, 18, 19 years old, and you're still treating them like a little seven-year-old kid, no, I don't that. well, see, that's what I'm talking about. Because some people treat 17, 18 year old kids like they're six and seven year old kids. I call them kids, but they're really grown. So that's what I'm talking about. But I'm also not just talking about that. I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, us as individuals as grown, 
grown individuals, some new Christians in the Lord. I'm saying if you just equate these rules of commandments as righteousness, you missed it. It needs to get in your heart that you do it because it because you love righteousness, right. not because it's a law or because Brother Smith said so or Brother Tucker taught well, it. We've been t been taught is what you're talking about. Uh, we've had our ministers all along to tell us that don't be telling your people that you dress like you do. Right. Because that I told and you. And Sister Grow, that has to keep being taught because there's right, new sure. people all the and time. Don't you think that us? We've always been taught that uh, us parents is supposed to help our children. That's what I'm Not teaching right family. now. Do you want to get but, up here and teach this? Well, <laughs> I'll let you teach right. it if you want to. But but anyway, I have been faced with this, that someone asked me, oh, why do, why do y'all do some of the things you're doing you didn't used to? In fact, business, I invited a lady to church, and she come for quite a long time, and I kept in touch with her, and she'd come along. Well, she got where that she picked our church. And I was nice to her. And she said, uh, someone had lipstick on. She said, do, do y'all? I thought y'all didn't believe in lipstick. I said, we don't. I said, we don't believe in wearing that. You know, we're Christian. And uh, I said, but remember, when you've got people, everybody's not going to do it just, just like everybody else, you know. But I, and then, then something else happened. And here she said it again. Well, I had to have a answer for her, you know. You know. Well, and then Harlan and I were shopping one day, and we seen her shopping center. Well, she was on one end of the store, and I was on the other. And we passed by the aisle, and I would see her. Well, she had her blue jeans on and looked just as worldly as anybody. And she did not want me to see her. But I never said a word to to condemn her or anything. I was always nice to her because I was trying to win her in the church because she's hunting for church. So anyway, uh, I, I kept going back and forth shopping around, and I could see her. And she'd look. She's dodging me. And I thought, honey, you can see me. I mean, you know, I just saw her. Cause finally, we run right into each other. I was just as nice to her. As I could be, I act like she was dressed like a saint, and she just as worldly she could be. But see, she did not want just me to see her because she was she had picked our church, and I had given her the best answers that I knew. I told her that yeah. when you've got a, a group of people, everybody's not going to do a lot. Everybody. No, they're not. In fact, this yeah. whole body, yeah. this body, but I believe doesn't all all of our, our body. Pastors in this body don't all teach the exact same standards. It's just wrong to think that the whole body does the same thing. They don't. Uh, but we hold a good standard overall. You know, we're still, I mean, and we've got that much flexibility that we recognize that there are men that, you know, that, that see things different from one another, and we accept that. Until God helps us work some of those things out, the bottom line to what I'm trying to get across is is that is is the true holiness that's to finally develop in our heart. It has to start out as commandments. It has to start out as as ordinances. But at some at some point it has to develop and become a part of character. And that's got to be taught right along with the commandments and with the ordinances that that we put out and so it's a developing process sure brother william Souders, when he first got saved he smoked a pipe and he was on his boat this is a known story about him he hadn't been saved very long he was a drinker and a smoker he was out there on his fishing boat, and he reached in his pocket to get his pipe out. And his testimony was that he heard a voice said, uh-uh. And he never experienced that before, and he didn't know what to do. 
Well, he put it back in his pocket. He went on down a little while. A little, little while later, he, he reached in his pocket again to get his pipe. And again, he felt like there was an impression or a voice saying to him within himself, uh-uh. He realized that was God talking to him. And that's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is that we cannot push people with commandments to a point that the Holy Ghost can't talk to them. And, just like he still had his pipe. And he may have, I don't know, he may have smoked it, and he might have just heard one huh, before he finally heard a huh-uh. But somewhere, God got his attention. And that's what I'm saying. Somewhere, we got to allow God to deal with us. And to work with us. And to help us. And, you know, at some point in serving God, we've got to grow up to a place where we're, where God, where, where God's talking to us. Now, if you said, well, why don't God just talk to us about everything? Because somebody's going to have to teach you and help you to understand. And it needs to be the Holy Ghost working that helps us to understand the difference between just a commandment and what is really righteous. See, we, we, we may have a dress standard because people need to know, you know, how a Christian ought to look, and then they, can, then they can begin to realize in their own mind as they evaluate it of how, how a person really ought to conduct themselves. What, what, what becomes fleshly? What becomes a part of the world? How do you live a life that is becoming of, of a righteous child of God. And people are on different levels, like Sister Crow was saying. You can't, you can't put everybody in the same basket. People are on different levels of their growth in God, and you've got to let them. It, we got a, we got a place in here. we got a kindergarten all the way through college education, all in the same class. And that's hard. That's hard. That's hard to be able to help the kindergarten kids and the grade school kids and the middle school kids and high school kids to find, and, and you're talking to them and the college education, kids in college. I'm talking about spiritual education. So, just like today, you know what I'm saying, there's some people that are not going to get it. There's some people that are, some people think I'm talking against commandments or standards or whatever, I'm certainly not. I'm trying to explain how we're going to get to this place of true holiness. What's the difference in true and uh, man-made holiness? Ideology of holiness? See, some of y'all have been around this body long enough to know what I'm talking about. That when you push a standard of living, when you push certain preacher's hobby horses about, you know, how to conduct themselves. I, I, I mean, I could, I could tell you what some of them are. I've told it before. When I came here, you never bought a, 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 a automobile with two doors in it. They taught against that strong. You never bought a red car, neither. Yeah, and that's what the teaching does. You've got to get to a place that you realize that, you know, I'm trying to please God out of my whole heart. But it has to develop to a place where it's actually true. It's not false. It's not some idea of a, you know, some people, you can get off a, a, in a ditch with your ideas. I'm just trying to get, I'm just saying, and I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to cover it today. But I'm just talking about a, a, balanced place of walking with God that helps us to develop into true righteousness where we're serving God because of our love for righteousness, our love for the Lord and we, we're learning how to behave ourselves outside of our own iniquity, our own walk in our own way, but the Lord's way. See, God, God has a dilemma also I'm learning that is because the Lord, he's, he's got such patience. Um, 
Anyway, I think we ought to just quit. It's about time to get upstairs. Anyway, I hope that I, I'm, and that's why I brought up about, you know, you can get people taught to get out in the Spirit and worship God and get in the Holy Ghost and dance and shout and rejoice in the things of God. And if you try to correct some of that a little bit, you're liable to stop them from doing all of it. And that's, that's the danger of trying to find a balance sometimes. So a lot of times preachers won't, they won't deal with it. Because yeah, you may work just a little bit on trying to stop something that might, you know, need some correction to it. But you may, you may stop up the whole stream. You may shut the whole faucet off. And then you may have to work a lot harder to get it open back up again. So that's not certainly not my point here. I'm not trying to come against righteousness, holiness, or any kind of, or a standard. I certainly believe in standards. It's not my hobby horse. I'm not one that wants you to cover up around the you know your neck and all the way to your feet, around your ankles. I remember Brother Souders one time saying. He said, you brother can teach your women whatever you want them. You can put a sack over their head and, and put them in any kind of robe you want to all the way to the shoelaces. And I can still tell you that that's a woman. You can't cover them up to where they ain't women. So he got on to us one time about it. He was trying to make a point about being too far with these laws and too far with our standards. But he certainly wasn't trying to do away with standards. Yes, if your mind has been taught correctly. If you're, if you, if, yeah, but you, you won't be able to have a mind that will probably listen to the Holy Ghost unless you're really, really, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You've got to have teaching, and that's going to help God deal with you. And so, you know, and I think that's, you know, that's the answer. It, it ta It's coupled with the Word of God and it's coupled with the Spirit of God and finding the proper balance which achieves the character of true righteousness. And that's all I'm saying. You know. I know, and, and, and on the child part of it, which is only part of what I was dealing with today, I understand as a parent you know, I understand how hard it is to take, to, to recognize our children growing up and take restraints off of them and trust them and let them develop in God. There it does come a point then when you get, you know, who was it I was the other day? I was looking at Eshan. Uh, uh, Sister Amy was back in the back of the sanctuary and Eshan was hugging her and I thought, my Lord, he's bigger than she is. You know, and I didn't realize he got that big, you know. and and uh, But these kids, they they grow up, don't they? And uh, so uh, I just know at some point you, got, you just got to kind of begin to release them to the Lord and say, God, I've done what I could do. And they're grown. They're yours. And, uh, you know, you still can have some influence over them. You still try to help them. But if you go too far with it, they'll, you'll drive them away from you. They won't be, you know, they won't be, it won't be easy for them to, to stay around where they're being treated like a seven-year-old kid, you know. So, anyway, God bless your hearts. We'll be upstairs and we'll have church here in a little while after the band's through. Huh? I hope nobody don't get me wrong.